I just kind of got the chills just saying that, but he apparently in the moment figured out how to like give into his ego. Like, exactly. He knew that was his only chance. You know? Yeah. Is just praising like the ego and also like convincing them that you're on their side and that you're the friend. Again, I told you, I've listened to so much true crime. So this is all <laughs> I'm thinking of like the, the different cases that I've heard where like, that's the way out is just playing to the ego and being like, no, I'm your friend. I'm on your side. But yeah. it's like, it's easier said than done. It's so scary when you are in the car with the guy. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the Pranzata podcast. This is your host, Andrea Pranzatelli. This is episode number 103 on this Pranzata podcast series on YouTube. We have another guest today. Today we have Leora Wood. Leora is a New York City based stand up comedian who specializes in musical comedy and storytelling style of comedy. She studied acting from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, and she also happens to serve as the head of the Education for Women's Stand Up New York City. So she has such an interesting background. I have so many questions for her today. There's going to be a lot to unpack here. Before we get into it, just as a reminder to the listeners, if you are new to this channel and you like what you hear today, please don't forget to hit subscribe. It is my mission to grow this channel this year and your support would be incredibly helpful. Also, please don't forget to comment on anything we talk about throughout the episode. I want this to be a community experience. So hearing what you guys have to say in response to some of the things we talk about actually means a lot to me and also helps this channel greatly. Okay, so Leora, my first question for you. Um, so you actually teach stand-up, is that correct? Yeah. You teach stand-up. So um, I'm a stand-up comedian as well. I hear a lot of negative things about stand-up classes. So from your perspective, to somebody who's heard negative things like, oh, you can't learn stand-up in a class, what would you? What would be your argument against that? What are some of the benefits you've seen as a teacher teaching stand-up? Like, why do people have this negative opinion about it? And, you know, how could they change their opinion about that? Oh my gosh, I love this question. And thank you for having <laughs> me, by the way. You're welcome, yeah. <laughs> um. I think this is so specific to like the kind of classes that I teach, not to like toot my own horn or be like, women stand yeah. up. Um, but I, I think that there is so much merit in saying that the best way to learn stand up comedy is to just go to an open mic and do stand up comedy. Like nothing is going to be a better teacher than just like bombing at an open mic and rewriting yeah. and figuring out what worked and what didn't. And at the same time, um, the class that I teach is specifically a beginner's class for folks of mm -hmm. marginalized genders. So um, women, trans folks, non-binary folks starting out in stand-up comedy. And so I think the merit in our class is providing a community to learn alongside just because stand-up comedy is, as I'm sure you know, such a male-dominated field. And so many people never get past that first step of going to the open mic and feeling like the room is warm and safe enough that you can bomb and it's like totally fine without having that initial base of like community. And so what we do, a lot of what I do is structuring lessons where we do writing exercises and we break down different kinds of stand-up comedy. But I think that's not why people come and take our classes. I think people take the class because like, there's um, a community now of women that are built in and and folks of marginalized genders that you can go to the open mics with, that you can sit and write in a cafe with. Um, and so I think it is just, it is that much easier than to do all of this stuff, um, learning stand-up comedy and kind of the school of hard knocks that people say that you should be doing anyway. So that that is really the the key selling point that like the classes and programming that I teach offers. Gotcha. So for you specifically, it's more of like a comfort for these people who don't have the confidence to just go on stage for the first time. You know what yeah, I mean? Like exactly. They, gotcha. That No, that's that's great. That's like enormous because if you don't have the confidence to go on stage the first time, then how are you going to do it? Now, how do you... Um, have you gotten any feedback from your students when they do take that first leap to go on stage have they ever gotten back and back to you and said like hey i did it and it felt great i felt comfortable or have they gotten back and said like hey i wasn't prepared for this like have you heard any feedback from anybody yeah we actually so as part of our our curriculum we make them go to at least two open mics so our we we do a six week class and at the end they have a showcase where they do their first ever tight fives and we are like we can't in good faith have you do a showcase if you've never been to an open mic yeah. So we do require it and we try and structure that experience as much as possible where it like we'll start them off 
with a list of open mics for it, like specifically like women and queer folks. So it's a little bit of a like less daunting an environment than to walk into like, oh, I'm I am the only person who's not a man in this room. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I've absolutely I think I think it totally depends, especially with like the New York comedy scene on what mic you stumble into. Yeah. Um, but we as part of the class even have like an open mic check in like halfway through once they've started actually writing a significant amount of material to take to a mic. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of mixed feedback. I think so much of it as a teacher is totally out of my control of like whatever you go out and experience in the New York comedy scene, some of the negativity and positivity is all kind of inevitable. Um, mm -hmm. But we also really encourage them like take a buddy, go with someone from the class. So even if like, you are the only two women in the room. At least like, yeah. you know that you have one person in the audience who's rooting for you. So we try and mitigate how awful, like my first open mic, I just like stumbled into a random place in the West Village, didn't know what was going on. And it was like all men. And I was reading off my phone and incredibly nervous. Mm -hmm. And so we try and at least tell them like, here's what the room that you're walking into looks like. And gotcha. here's a buddy that you can bring because we don't yeah. know what's going to happen in the room, but we're trying to structure the experience beforehand. So you you kind of let them know in advance, like, hey, you're going to go on stage. It's going to be a male dominated field. You know, you, you yeah. tell them in advance. Gotcha. No, that's great. Um, so my next question for you, how did you become passionate about this specifically? Was there a specific event in your life that kind of um, push you to want to work in this field or did you just see a need for it in general? Like how did this happen for you? In terms of teaching or stand-up comedy or a little bit of all, all um, of the above? I, I, we, I mean, we could go into that too, stand-up comedy, but I was talking specifically about the teaching end of it. Oh yeah. So um, Women Stand Up was the company that like I started my stand-up career with. Like I went up through the newbie program that I am now kind of running, mm -hmm. which is a, a cool kind of full circle thing. Um, but the the original two girls who created it, it was part of their um, visa application. And during the pandemic, ended up moving home to Canada. And so there were a couple of us alumni who were really still passionate about it and wanted to keep it going. And we're just mm -hmm. like triaging the company during the pandemic where like everything was shut down. And we were just doing it because we cared about the mission of having a place for folks of marginalized gender in comedy to learn and grow and write jokes and build community. Um, and so within that, I run the company with two other women. Um, and we were all just kind of trying to figure out what played to our individual strengths. So, um, Paula Leon is the head of media. So she does all of our social media and all of our outreach. And she had a background in that. So it made sense. Susan Dorf is our head of production. And again, similarly, like she came up through theater school and had a lot of experience, like behind the scenes doing like production stuff in theater. And so it was kind of a natural one to one. And I have always been very like, academically minded in terms of like, how do I do that? How do I break that down? So I had no formal teaching experience. But I one of my biggest joys in stand up comedy is the actual writing of the thing and the mm -hmm. mechanics and figuring out like, how does that joke work? Why does that joke work? How do I make it better? Mm -hmm. um, and I started teaching like a year and a half into my career. So arguably before I had anything good to say. Um, but I, I had a lot of thoughts about like kind of how you can be a good writer and how you can be a good performer even if I didn't know much about like the industry that was the piece that came later and is still kind of coming gotcha. yeah um so it was just like okay we're all we all want this company to work we are all putting our best foot forward and offering the skills we have and that was kind of the hole that needed to be filled and uh, it it was the thing that best match uh, match my skill set and I'm still still learning how to be a good teacher. It's not, <laughs> um, it wasn't an immediate thing, but I, I'm enjoying that challenge. Yeah, no, there is something to say about being a teacher. And sometimes, like you said before, that arguably you were teaching something that you may or may not have had experience in some of these fields. There is something to say about that because I'm a piano teacher. I don't know if the people in the, in the camera is going to be able to see my piano here when I uh, do the editing, but there's a piano here. Um, there's times where I don't always have time. I have some advanced students, you know, um, right. especially the ones that have been with me for a long time. So I have some students that are advancing that I've never actually learned the piece that they're working on. <laughs> and it's, they've gotten to a point where they could play it better than I could, but 
right being an analytically minded person i'm still able to like break it down and say okay well if i was learning this piece this is how i would do it like sort of thing so there is something to say about being a teacher and like not always having the time to do all the work but being able to explain it and break it down in a certain way that is a skill set you know yeah absolutely and some of it too and i'm sure you you find this as well is like being the person who is even if you're at like a, a similar skill level being the person who is a step removed from the work that mm -hmm. like has the privilege of looking at it analytically because it's not like when you're making a piece of art that's your baby and there's so much emotionally tied up in it and some of being a teacher i found too is like not necessarily being like the smartest or the most qualified but being able to look at the thing and know how emotionally important it is for the person and also be like, okay, this is not my baby. And therefore, it's a little bit easier for me to critique and take apart. That's so funny you say that. Like two things came to my mind when you said that. Yeah. One is like, I used to always joke around this with my teachers um, when I was studying music in college. I would say I would be such a better musician if I didn't love music. Meaning like, yeah. I would get so like, <laughs> passionate when I, when I was playing, I would get like so excited and so passionate about what I was playing that like I would play too fast or I wouldn't like stop and think about things. And I'm like, I don't want to stop and think about this. I love this. And I just want to like keep going. And she's like, okay, but you have to break this down practice slowly. So it's like, man, if I didn't love this, it would be easy. So, th so it, that right. kind of like goes in hand with what you just said. It reminded me of that. Um, and there was another thing that came to mind. Um, I used to have trouble with songwriting. I don't do musical songwriting, but just like uh -huh. music, you know, regular musician songwriting. I used to take it so seriously because I was like, so um, I had these musical idols and I was like, Oh my God, I want my songs to be as yeah. good as Fiona Apple or good, you know, as good as Amy Winehouse or whatever. And when I first started songwriting, I took it so seriously. And I remember one time somebody came to me and they wanted help. They wanted to co-write a song for their wedding. They were like, you know, they were paying lessons from me and they're like, Hey, I want to write a song for my husband, you know, or fiance soon to become husband for the wedding. Um, I have a good singing voice, but I need help like learning it on the piano. And I just remember like when I worked with her, because it wasn't my project, I was able right. to like write the song, like co well, co-write with her. We wrote it together, but ideas were coming out of me flawlessly, like lyrics, like corny love lyrics that like, if it was my song, I would take it so seriously. And it ended up being a great song. And I'm like, huh, it's just like removing myself, like removing my ego from it makes yeah. such a huge difference, you know? No, I literally had that experience this week where I've been going through such a period of writer's block because I've been feeling like I've been focusing more on like social media and that aspect of things than like actually sitting yeah. down to write. And now sitting down to write has become this like really like terrifying thing just because I haven't done it in a little bit. But I had the opportunity this this week to be part of like a, a sketch writer's room. Yeah. And I was like, oh, punching up jokes. And like, if it's less precious, and if there's a group of people, and we're all kind of working collaborative, collaboratively, you kind of get that like, second voice in the back of your head who's like, well, that's not good, blah, 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 out. And it's so much easier to offer a punch and like find the joke and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I know it, like exactly what you're talking about. I swear that just yeah, happened that, to me this past that, week. That like group collaboration, things happen so quickly there. I don't know what yeah. it is, but it's like you, it's, it's not so much pressure when there's a group of people, you know? Right. And you're just like excited to say your piece. So you're not even thinking about it enough to judge it because when you're just sitting alone, you feel like you have infinite time. So you can yeah. judge each joke before you write it. Yeah, no, that's, that's such a good point. Um, okay. My next question, I feel like since we're on the subject of being a woman in a male dominated field, I'm actually in two male dominated fields. Yeah. Like, you, you, sorry, I'm like burping cause I'm drinking seltzer. My bad to you and the people <laughs> listening. Um, Music and comedy are very male dominated fields. Um, I feel like the listeners, if if I have any males listening or whatever, I feel like they should know the struggles of being a woman. So I, I wanted to ask, have you personally, do you have any like interesting stories about like whether you were on stage and a man made you uncomfortable or um, just in life? Like, like, has there any been any weird, creepy got hit on stories this week in New York City? Like, oh like anything, anything like that? <laughs> For the first year that I was really like pounding the pavement and going to open mics, I kept a list on my phone of stuff that guys would say to me because I was going to a lot of like feedback mics because I really wanted yeah. to work on my writing. And I would get like weird notes like, 
Oh my gosh. One of my favorites to this day is I got up and I did my jokes and whatever. And this next guy gets up and he's just like, that is the whitest bitch I've ever seen. <laughs> and I'm like, you're right. I am. I am the whitest bitch most people have seen. <laughs> um, oh gosh. Another one from that list was someone, it was like, it was a feedback mic. So you're supposed to offer feedback on, you know, people's jokes and, and their punchlines and whatever. And this guy was like, this isn't really about your jokes. It's just about your persona. I feel like you have such a girl next door thing going on. I feel like you're so innocent that you would like cry listening to profanity and rap music. Really? <laughs> and I was like, I don't, but how do I take that note? Like, how yeah, do I it's apply like, how is that? And you know what? This whole, I have to say too, I, I don't think comedians have to be this like rugged, like rough around oh, the yeah. edges on stage and necessarily either because I, I talked about this on a different episode as well. So like, apologize if some of the listeners already heard this, but you know, for the people who didn't, I had, I had interviewed this one comedian or she's Japanese. Her name is y- Yumi Nagashima. And she has like this very innocent, sweet stage presence. And uh-huh. the juxtaposition of her stage presence with the stuff she says on stage is such a, like a amazing, like, like it it makes her stand out more because like some of the stuff she says, like you, you're like, you wouldn't expect this like sweet loving person to say this stuff. So I actually don't like, I don't think you have to be this like tough, like, you know, whatever you want to call it, like tomboy gal to like be on stage and, and be a good joke teller. Like you just, you have to have good writing. And I think sometimes, you know, those innocent personalities could actually work in your benefit. You know, I don't know if you agree. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think so. And I also think, I don't know, there's a power in being a little bit underestimated because like people don't know what's going to come out of your mouth. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know that I love it in like all aspects of the career, especially because I'm, I'm someone that's just like hyper femme presenting. Like I'm going to show up to an open mic in like a pink dress and a matching bow and whatever, like literally cartoon character. And like, that's, that's just part of it. Like it's all kind of part of the joke and it's, it's fodder for more things. Um, Yeah. So I, I think, I think any, anyone in any personality type can be a comedian. There just has to be that level of self-awareness that like people are going to clock how you present when you put yourself on stage and you either have to like work with it or work against it. But I think as long as you're aware of it, it works. Have you ever heard of this uh, female stand-up comedian, Esther Pavinsky? Uh, I don't know her last name. Esther oh. Pavinsky? Esther Pavinsky? Oh, the name sounds so familiar. Uh, let I, me li- I don't want to screw this up because I'm I- I'm going to. So let me just like, I have my phone right here. Esther. Yeah, Esther. Esther. P- Esther Pavitsky. She is a um a stand-up she's, comedian who is incredibly, like you said, feminine presenting. She's so feminine, but she's so funny. Like she's so one of the funniest comedians like I've seen, like one of the funniest new comedians I've seen, but she's incredibly like docile and feminine presenting. So yeah. that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, you know. Yeah, okay. I think I do know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. She's really funny. Yeah, if you haven't heard her, you got to check her out. Like, give her a listen because she's so, like, sweet and innocent and very feminine. Like, the way she dresses. Like, she kind of, she's kind of almost like the cool girl in high school that, like, you wanted to be friends with. Like, but yes. she was like, like, so she's very much like that, but she's so funny. One of the greatest, you know? Um. Okay. My next question for you. Okay storytelling so yeah. i saw on your bio that that's something you've you're you specialize in um so i've never really tried storytelling version of stand-up but i have good stories from my life so i it might be something that i try at some point oh absolutely do you have any tips for like what makes a good story yes i do i literally we do a whole week in the class that I, teach <laughs> yeah, you, I just saw you like light up you're like yes I I, so i'm trying not to like bring out the powerpoint and be like yeah. here we go um but no and my students anyone who's ever taken my class too will be like it's a it's a whole different ball game during storytelling week i'm like all right here we go because observation week like i can teach but it's it's all through like what i know to be true storytelling week i'm like let's go yeah um yeah, I think I think any story can be stand up comedy. You just have to approach it the right way. And you have to acknowledge that, like, it's not going to be the same version of the story. That is like the story that you tell at a cocktail party and everyone yeah. is dazzled and delighted by it. Like, it's not a story doesn't become stand up comedy until you punch it. 
And there's a couple ways to do that. Um, either if it's like a short story, you can add all of these different like tangents and stuff and, and structure it the way that we kind of talk when we're telling a story because you'll be telling a story about like your family Thanksgiving and then you'll be like oh wait but for this to really land you need to know this whole other bit about my aunt and so even if it's a short story and you're doing like a 15 minute set there's a way to structure it and be like okay and now I'm going to go and do three minutes on my aunt and like build this character um so it's 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 being cognizant of punching specifically it's it's thinking about like how do I make the amount of like physical story that I have fill the vessel of like an eight minute set, a 15 minute set, however much it is. Um, and how do I keep the audience engaged, even if just by the nature of it being a story, there's a little long until a punchline. Like the rule of thumb that I always teach is basically like the longer that you have to wait for a punchline, the better that the audience expects it to be because that there's that ramping anticipation so sometimes it's better to just like throw in a one-off punch that's not really related so you can just keep the audience's attention but i love to really like build the world of a story because then things become callbacks that don't even have to be super punched it's just like people feel rewarded for being like oh that was that guy that you mentioned five minutes ago and it's funny that he's back so there's ways to do it in terms of like making the audience feel smart and making them want to double down and be invested like one of my favorite stories to tell i did an hour this past summer and this was like the 15 minutes that i closed out my hour with it was literally just about like a night that i went to get drinks with my friends and we went to three different bars but i kept meeting all of these like guys that were like kind of hitting on me and they were just such characters and one of them like the first guy that i met was calling me all night and so that became the punchline that like i'm off doing whatever at the the, the next bar but like andrew's still calling and the audience is like, oh, my God, Andrew, he's back. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're like, OK, I think I get the idea. You're like finding ways. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's like making it thematic in a way, because like you're you're calling him back. So it's like thematic in that way. And then it's also like building in little punches as you go, like finding ways to sneak him in. It's funny you said that about learning how to keep the audience audience's attention it's almost like in a way you need to understand psychology a little bit yes it's like you're jingling keys in front of them it sounds manipulative like it sounds totally manipulative but i've like you were saying before that you've been working a lot of like the instagram marketing end of things i've been learning a lot of that you know as well because i want this i want to build a team of people eventually who will do that for me but right now i'm still growing so like i'm like a one woman show over here and i'm like i feel like I used to just be a musician and a comedian and now I'm like a marketing person. And part of a lot of the research I'm doing is like psychology, like, (laughs) like, and it like, it sounds incredibly manipulative, but that's like how they do it in every field. That's how they do it when they create your smartphones, whoever found out about how to do smartphones (laughs) and apps is fucking smart because um, people are addicted to that. But it's like anytime people, you know, put out, con- I think about it when I put on content on social media, like, so like when I post, like I'll do like photo shoots, like um, modeling type photo shoots. And I don't, I just realized something. I don't post a picture every day. That's a bad idea because then people just kind of get used to you. I'm like, right. if you get used to somebody, they're not like as like attractive or like standing out anymore. But if you show them like a nice like picture, you know, that grabs their attention, they're like going to be checking. Is it coming back? Is it coming back? And then a week <laughs> later when it comes back, they're like, yeah, we got another one. But like, if you sent, if you put up a picture of yourself every day, they're going to be like, okay, we're used to that now. So there is like exactly. a psychology element of it, you know? Yeah. I was just, um, I was like in a comedy festival a weekend ago and um, they were, there was like a seminar where they were talking a lot about like, TikTok and social media. And it's interesting too, because they were like, um, your video should have a consistent element so people can like recognize you as they're scrolling through just because it's so much. And so they were like, if you film in the same room with the same background, so just like the, the visual they know. And I was like, oh, that's really smart. And then my second thought was like, do you know um, Miss Rachel, who's the the girl that does like, she does content for like toddlers um, I think in the toddler I, crowd. I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> but she like, she wears the same outfit every single time. Cause it's really good for, for like babies and their facial recognition yeah. to be like, Oh, this is the same lady. She wears the same outfit every time. And I'm like, okay, so the same tactics that we're using for like 
full-blown adults on social media to be like oh that's the same girl her wall's always the same in the background is like yeah the same that a toddler educator is using like some of it i guess is just kind of primitive like just back in in our brains yeah no that's a good point because like when when there's like a thing that you could recognize like okay that's the color i'm bad at that i I feel like i keep changing my scene because like i'm literally moving into different apartments so i have to all the time so but so i don't really have like that part of it i'm still kind of trying to work out but you're right certain youtubers i listen to or like podcasters i listen to i like latch on to it because i recognize the thumbnail oh that's the yeah. thumbnail and the color and the and the everything so you're right there's like a certain consistency to it that makes people stand out like a product or something you know right no it's so much of just like selling yourself like a product which is like a weird it's messed up really like you have to <laughs> Step away from yourself and be like, what are the parts about me that people like? And that yeah. is a yeah, that's a whole black hole to fall down. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 there's like a, I mean, like I really enjoy doing this, but there is some times where it's like, wow, this is like slightly depressing when you think about it. But it's an important <laughs> what helped me put that into perspective, like the depressing end of things is um, there's this uh, musician YouTuber called Adam Neely. He's great at music theory, and he he had like a listener he he takes like questions and answers and he had a mm-hmm. listener say that exact thing he's like how do i stop getting depressed over the fact that i have to market myself on social media and instagram right. instead of focusing on music and his response was there was always a game to play in every generation this is just our generation's game he's like back in the day and whatever the 70s 80s 90s you had to like be this like perfect sexy icon and and um kiss ass to like record labels he's like so that was the game you had to play then he's like now it's a different game when you think about it that our game now is a little better than that like that's terrible like you had to be this like young perfect like sexy and now you just you can find your quote-unquote brand and it doesn't have to be just that there's like many ways you could do it now you know right it's weird because in some ways tiktok has been kind of like the great equalizer that anyone can post a video on TikTok and like, however the algorithm works, it might spit it out. And like, theoretically, anyone can post and anyone can see it. And at the same time, we have these kind of like, social media star, like royalty, that a platform that should be like, oh, anyone can see it. Anyone is like, no, you're really only going to see these like 10 people or 15 people, even like within a niche. And so it's a, it's a weird thing to, to be like, theoretically, yes. And also, I I don't know how I would ever get the numbers that these people are. But again, like it's it's the game, and it is in a lot of ways. I definitely agree. Like it's an easier game to play because it's it's more clear of like yeah. what the expectations are. I think than it ever has been. Yeah, and also like your boss in this game isn't it, it's it's the algorithm, which isn't right. really a, it's not a person. The algorithm is just like people collectively. So it's like I mean you could argue that like what people gravitate to might not be the healthiest. Like there could be (laughs) that, but I think everybody's algorithm is different. Like different people are going to have different algorithms on their phone, like depending on them. So I'm sure whatever you are, there is an algorithm out there for you, you know? (laughs) No, it's so true. And I love like, that's my favorite question is asking people like what weird side of TikTok they're on. Cause I feel like it's so telling. Mm Mm-hmm. Like I was on like stuffed animal restoration TikTok for a minute. <laughs> and I loved it there. It was so sweet. I'm very like, I don't do TikTok. I might just be too old. I don't know how old. Am I allowed to ask how old you are? If that, if that's okay. Yeah, I'm 25. Okay, so I'm 35. So I'm, I think I'm too old. Like I could go on TikTok, but I feel like it's just, it doesn't really pull me in because I I kind of prefer the longer form so I'm definitely a big YouTube agree, yeah. person and my algorithm is all right now my algorithm is all like health stuff which I think is good like like I'm okay like at least I'm not looking there were dark, I, I went through some dark times in my life and like I remember this one time I went through like this was years ago I went through um my algorithm was all like deaths on ferris wheels and like that. 
<laughs> like just oh like, no <laughs> like because it's the thing is like once you hit one and you're like locked in like right. the, the the phone or or the algorithm recognizes okay she's watching this and she's watching the whole video so then it starts sending you she'll probably like this one she'll probably like this one and before you know it it's like sunday afternoon and i'm watching like 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 somebody died at six flags here and i'm like what happened like my whole my whole right. game just got like taken over by this you know oh my gosh i feel you i was on a real true crime spree and like that <laughs> kind of thing like once you get a little bit into true crime and that's like spit out at you and you're like you're fascinated like you're locked in there but yeah. you're also spending your day being like oh and they chopped this person into pieces like it's such a oh my gosh it's such yeah, a weird thing I've, i eventually kind of learned to um I, what I started doing this year is when I started taking it more seriously is I kind of, I first, I stopped myself from jumping on the impulse of looking at things like that, but I actually started on Instagram. Um, I don't know if they could do it on TikTok, but on Instagram, you can actually um, click the three, whatever the three white buttons and you can write, don't recommend this to me. Oh yes. And yes. Yeah. The more you do that. So I've like, trained myself to be like stop like like I don't need to be looking at girls booty pics all day long <laughs> like like you know what I mean like like I need to stop um so now like if you go to the information feed it's like health related stuff and I'm like okay I right, really want to okay. keep my algorithm like clean and healthy for me not that there's anything wrong with indulging in anything weird like that from time to time but I don't need it to be my whole 24 7 you know exactly yeah and that's that's kind of a nice way to think about it too is like ultimately we as the consumers do get a say in like, this is the kind of thing that I want to be consuming. Like yeah. if, if social media is such a currency, like we do have a, a vote and a say. Yeah. And it's like, you have to have learn how to have the self discipline to be able to. Oh, that. absolutely. That's the harder part by far. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Ooh, okay. My next question. So you, you said you went to NYU, um, school, Tisch school of the arts to study acting. My question for you is, I went to um, to college for music and I personally have regrets about it, um, mainly because of the student loan bill. Um, but I did learn a lot as well. So my question is, um, how's your pers like opinion about graduating with an acting degree? Any regrets, pros and cons? Like, was it a good experience? Wouldn't recommend it. Like, what's your take on that? Yeah, I... I think I am very lucky in that like I got to do my degree the way that I wanted to. And I left being like, that was the experience that I needed to have. It wasn't not even that it was like consistently positive, but I think the the negative things that happened to me were also entirely necessary. Like I came in my freshman year with a big ego because I was coming from a high school where it was like, you know, big fish, small pond. Um, and so I think I was in the right place to learn and to get the ego kind of healthily resized, but also like meet a lot of people that would be huge collaborators. Like I think a, a drama degree is unique in that so much of the skills. And now I'm just going to give you the same spiel that I gave my parents when I was trying to apply for drama school. Um, but it, like so many of the skills carry on to other facets of life in terms of like, public speaking in terms of like, I mean, just like social emotional learning and like, really, like sitting and spending the day working on like, yeah. empathy and connecting with people. Um, but there's so much in terms of just like, knowing how to present yourself and speak your mind confidently that is can carry over onto really any field. Um, and that being said, like the training that I got was super vocational and very much like, here, here is what it actually looks like to be a working actor. And I was lucky that I got to do that in New York City, which is where I ultimately wanted to end up. So it was kind of like I got to spend four years playing at professional actor in the city that I was going to stay in. So it was like all scaffolded. And then I graduated and all of the scaffolding was just taken away. So I felt like um, it was for me, an easy transition into post grad life and like life as a working artist because that was essentially what I was doing for four years. Gotcha. Um, it's kind so of like what you were talking, sorry to interrupt you, but it oh, reminded no, me like what you're talking about with your acting class that you teach. It's kind of like it gave you the comfort of knowing how to do this before you actually do this. Exactly. No. And I think that's the biggest thing is like, I could sit around and talk about like the technical skills that I learned and like how to break down words phonetically and whatever. And, and that is important to be an actor, but yeah. the skills that I'm like, 
that was worth it. That was worth the degree were the ones that were are more like, here's how you are an adult. Here's how you are a functioning, like working artist and uh, like a holistic being in in a city and in a competitive industry. And like, those were the skills and just like meeting incredible people that are like collaborators. That was the biggest thing that I needed to learn was like how to collaborate and how to yeah. play nice. Yeah. Um, and those, I don't, I don't think I would have learned other places. Gotcha. For me, I, I had a good experience um, overall with learning music in a music school. Uh -huh. For me, it was the money thing. That was like yeah. a big regret for me. Cause I mean, I don't know how you did it. I personally took out student loans and now I have a lot of student student loan debt over it. So like, usually what I tell people, like when they ask me, like, I'm like, the actual experience was great. The college experience was a good and beneficial one for me. Um, the debt was not. <laughs> so for me, I would like, uh, for me, I wish I could go back and do it in a way where I didn't have to take out all those student loans. Right. If I could do it again, I would either just hire like, well, not even, I would just take classes from college professors and not get the degree. <laughs> like I would, right. like, like, cause I don't, I didn't need to do the English, the math or this, while those things are great and they're beneficial, I didn't really need them to become a musician. Um, so I probably would have just like, came in and just like uh, they, they have a word for this um the students who just come in i don't know if it's non-matriculated i don't remember the words anymore. oh i know that like auditing like if you're auditing like a class it's something like, like you're taking it but you're yeah i think you no know, non-matriculated might be correct yeah yeah there, there's there's something for like students who are not they're not in the college but they just come to take classes and pay for it right i would right. just came and take took classes um for the ones i wanted to learn like so piano lessons from somebody with really good experience music theory i would have just done that um or like hired professors privately and went to their home studio to learn these skills type of thing or i just wouldn't have taken out loans i would have like done a right. very slow route and paid out of pocket like slowly or something right. like that if i could do it differently that's that's really my only qualm that i had with college and, and you know there were some like have you ever had anything in um, acting school where you're like, wait a second, what they taught me in this class was totally different. What, what I learned in real life. Was there anything like that for you? Um, hmm. yes and no. I mean, so much of it, like just because I, I took, it wasn't like a right turn. It was like a, like a little diagonal from the acting industry into the comedy industry. And there's a fair amount of overlap. And so I can't, necessarily be like oh i got out of school and i can say that the things that the teachers told me about the industry is true or not true i think that there were certainly some tactics applied that were outdated in terms of like uh, there were there were some things that would sometimes feel like scare tactics in terms of like um the people in this room could be the people that get you jobs, but they could also be the people in that, like, if they don't like you could keep you from getting jobs. And so there was this kind of like constant pressure to get along with everyone. And that like the dumb mistakes that you're making as a freshman, which like everyone, everyone is a little bit stupid freshman year of college will follow you into your professional career. When I think like, that's the thing that I'm like, I don't know that that's the case because as much as like the industry is incredibly small and everyone is really like only a couple of connections away at the same time, like the industry is like vast. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think like we know enough to not hold the things that people did when they were 19 against yeah. them in a way that like, there was definitely this expectation that like from day one, you are professional and you need to act as such. And we just like, we didn't always know how to when you're that young. Yeah, yeah they were trying to like drill that in, in you, I guess, at a very young age, I suppose. So you were saying, interesting, you were saying before that um, you started going to school with an ego and then you kind of like broke out of that. What are some of the things that helped you break out of your ego, like psychedelics? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing was realizing that um, other people aren't competition, and like, I can say that now. And at the same time, it's still something that I'm working on, even like within stand up. Um, 
but the the specific oh my gosh hello what's the cat's like, name this is billy he was like meowing and crying so i just picked him up because i was like i don't want the noise to get in the background so <laughs> hopefully if i just hold him for a little bit he'll stop crying i don't even oh, know why God. he's crying he already had dinner so i think he just like kind of wants attention from me or something he just wants to be featured on the pod <laughs> he's jealous <laughs> but anyways go ahead Going back to uh, what you were saying about competition, realizing oh, yeah. people aren't competition. Yeah, I think that was such a big part of it is like, I was always kind of comparing my self worth to other people in terms of like what I'm bringing to the room and like, yeah. what I can do as an actress. And I think that is was like part of the ego was the ego was kind of like a protective barrier to be like, well, if I hold myself in this regard, then I know that like I can come out on top when there's a competition and realizing that like we are all on our own journeys and we're all going at our own pace. And if anything, like there's collaboration to be had, like my specific program was really, really big on collaboration for better or worse, like throwing a bunch of people in a room and being like, you need to figure out how to make a play in a week and come back and present it in class. And there was a lot of like, just go and make the thing and come back. Um, that like there wasn't room for competition in that because we were all working towards the same end goal. Um, so I think that was the biggest thing is just being like, oh, everyone, everyone wants the same thing that I want. We're all going after the same. And there is so much room for us all to have success. And it's going to be a much more pleasant ride if we are all wishing success for each other and working on it together than me constantly looking over my shoulder and being like, well, she got that role or like this happened for her and whatever, because it's just like, it's not sustainable. It, it doesn't feel pleasant to sit in that mindset. There is something to be said about like collaboration forces you to let go of your ego. Um, yeah. I've noticed that recently because um, I just went through a breakup with somebody I was living with. Oh, and I'm sorry. Nah, yeah, it's okay. I mean, it's sad, but I'm getting through it. Um, we when we broke up, we still had two months to live together on the lease. Oh, and okay. So there was a lot of ups and downs of like, well, we're stuck here together, so we have to right. collaborate. We have to get along. We have to figure out how to make this work. And like, I remember specifically, there was one week where we were arguing about something, and I was definitely a lot of ego on my part. Like, I I couldn't let go of like the things that went wrong in the relationship. Like, I couldn't just like accept that we're all human and people screw up. I was like really holding on to like a lot of anger from things in the relationship. And then he got, he ended up getting like really sick and to the point, you know, I don't want to give TMI like with grossness, but he was throwing up like all night. Like I've never, right. I've never seen somebody throw up like all night. Like I've seen it for like an hour, but it was like, right. no, that's okay. scary. That's yeah. So really I was scary. like, I was like, he's in pain. He's suffering. Like I have to take him to the hospital. So it was like one of those humbling moments where I was like, I'm not going to sit here and be mad about what you did in the past. Like you're dying right now. Like I, right, need, to, exactly. I need to take this care is of the you. Yeah. So it's like, it was a very humbling moment for me because it's like in those it's sad, but like in states of catastrophe, it seems like, all right, well, now we have to work together to get through this, you know, and you let go of the ego in those cases. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah so that it reminded me of that for some reason. Um, okay. So I don't want to keep you here too long. I, I know we've been going almost an hour, so I have a few more questions for you. Um you did. I did want to bring this up because you put it on your bio, and I was like, okay, I, I have to ask her about this. You said you were a barista, and that you had a lot of interesting experiences on that. So I would, I would be curious to hear you elaborate on, um, like, crazy customers or what you meant by crazy stories. But before you do that, can you actually explain to the listeners what is a barista in case they don't know? Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the barista is the person who makes your coffee. Um, <laughs> So I was, I was working, I never worked at like a big chain, like a Starbucks or anything like that. I was mostly working at, um, kind of small mom and pop independently owned coffee shops. Um, but yeah, you're, you're running the espresso machine. You're getting in at 6am to make the drip coffee. You're pulling the pastries with the little tongs. Um, so I was, yeah, I was working as a barista, um, throughout most of college, like coming home and working in the summers. And, um, during my senior year I was like a student part-time and working as a barista so that is that is bar baristing <laughs> <laughs> any um so you were saying in the bio like 
you had some crazy stories from that. Is there anything in particular that comes to mind? Like, yes. Oh my gosh. I have two <laughs> and they used to be part of my, um, stand up my act. routine when I was first starting stand up. The first was, um, we had this lady, this is, I'm, I'm home for the week in New Hampshire. And this was it at my very first coffee shop job in New Hampshire. And we had this woman come in, um, and she had like called before and asked if we had like gluten-free pastries or something because the the bakery that I worked at specifically specialized in gluten-free. So we were like, yeah, we have everything. And she on the phone wanted us to list out every single item in the bakery case. So that was already like, okay, there's something going on here. Um, and so she comes in and immediately she's one of those people where like when she walks in the room, you're like, this is a tornado human, like something, something is about to happen. And like the shop is closing down for the day. So I'm like in the corner somewhere sweeping, like I am not even the person taking her order, but she has a million questions. Um, and she wants to try something new and she's like, okay, I'm going to try the matcha. And we explained to her, like, it's not coffee, it's tea, it's going to be bright green, whatever. And she's holding a baby this whole time, but she's holding a baby in the way of like someone that's never met a baby before. Like she's not, she's not doing a good job of holding <laughs> the baby. Um, and so at this point, like a line starts forming behind her because she's just been asking so many questions and talking for so long. Um, And so I'm going and helping make the drinks and I make like someone's drink before hers that is clearly like a brown like coffee and she's ordered a a tea Um, and she like takes it and starts sipping it and being like, oh, this is great. It doesn't really taste like tea, though. I don't know what you guys are saying. (laughs) <laughs> and it was someone else's drink. And she's like trying to switch out the straw and be like, no, 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 I barely sipped it. You can have it. And she's like trying to negotiate the drinks. And as she's doing that, she like can't hold the baby. So she just puts the baby in her purse. Oh, my God. Are you <laughs> serious? That, that just yes. like mortified me uh, in her purse. How yes, big is it? It was kind baby. of like a, like a tote. Um I don't know much about babies, so I couldn't be like, <laughs> like oh, you know, 18 months. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, how does a baby... It must have been a tiny baby, like, or unless it was just a huge purse, but... It was like a tote bag situation. Yeah. And the baby was definitely old enough that it could hold up its neck by <laughs> itself. So it wasn't like flopping around in the purse. But I would say, I would say like... Sorry, my little brother is upstairs just yelling. Um... The baby, I like maybe under a year old, like old enough that it could support its neck, but yeah. young enough that it could fit in a tote bag. That's yeah. the kind of middle age that the baby was. Oh my God, that's insane. Yeah, no, I've worked in the restaurant business. Like I've done bartending. I've never done coffee, but I've done bartending, waitressing. Mm-hmm. I used to work at a movie theater. There were some wild stories from that. Like I'm trying to think if anything is coming to mind for me too. There's so many. Yeah, I remember when I worked at the movie theater, I was 18, 19 years uh-huh. old. Um, I was actually a manager. I became manager pretty young there because I started working there when I was 16. So by right. the time I was like 18 or 19, I was already like so familiar with the environment. Um, That's and, my favorite. And people are like, oh, can I speak to your manager? And it's just a child. Like I... So that's okay. That's this is that's where the story is going. So this man, oh, amazing. Okay. this like kind of um, southern speaking man, he came in and he was like, um, you know, do you guys have the um, uh, the flavor like like a certain Hagen Doss flavor? Hagen Doss. I don't yeah. know how to pronounce that. He wanted the um, the almond one, I think, and we didn't have the almond one. We had the vanilla, something like that, and we were out of it and he was furious. He was like, let me speak to your manager. And I was like, well, I'm the manager. And he was like, Oh, he was like a woman. (laughs) (laughs) And he goes, he goes, no wonder you guys got nothing in stock. They shouldn't put women in management. (laughs) It was like (laughs) this, like really? Yeah. So it was, I I've had all kinds of crazy stories like that. I've been doing Ubering lately part time for some extra cash. And I've also had some really, kind of frightening stories because you're alone. Oh, yeah. Like when, when you have a crazy person at the movie theater, like you have all your coworkers around you, but when right. you're like a single woman Ubering strange men and they're in your car alone, like at night, it, it gets scary. I, right. before the podcast ends, I should tell you this one. Um, I had one guy come in and it was really awkward because it was a half hour drive. Um, but he, he he started telling me his job and uh-huh. just to paint the picture too, he looks exactly like um what, what's it Tucker and uh, there's like a zombie movie called Tucker or something. Let me see if I can figure this out. Tucker and Dale. Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Um let me oh. find, I'm okay, gonna find I think, 
Yeah, I have a picture of him. Okay. He looks exact. I don't know if the listeners. He looks exactly like that. <laughs> oh, okay. So he, he was right. hold- I mean, he was not holding a chainsaw, but he might as well have been holding a Except chainsaw. Except for that, minus the chainsaw. Yeah. So he looked yeah. like that. Okay. Um, and he was like, "Tell me about his job." He's like, "You know, I, I heal the chakras." <laughs> yeah, like a southern actor. He's like, "I heal the chakras," and um, he's like, "I gotta say, I'm reading your energy." And I could see like you, you have a lot of tension and then I'm like, and like childhood trauma. And I'm like, actually, yeah, I do. Like, tell me more. Like I was interested. And, um, he's like, well, he's like, I have this way of releasing the chakras. He goes, I do a pelvic release. And I'm like, oh God, here we go. And he's like, like, he's like what I do. And he's like, and it's professional. He's like, nothing like that. He's like, I allow a woman to release an orgasm. And he's like, and I can do it in 40 seconds. Like, he's like, and if you think you've had an orgasm, Orgasm. you've never had an orgasm like after you've come to me and i was like okay and like at first okay at first i wasn't even that scared i was more just like maybe that's actually what he does for a living just like fascinated yeah, yeah i was like okay maybe that's what he does for a living but then it started getting weird when he was like it, it was a long drive and he was like he started getting like you know god brought he's like i have to say i don't know why but god brought us here together for a reason oh, he's no. like i he's like i had a dream yesterday i was supposed to meet somebody and he's like i've never he's like i haven't fallen in love <laughs> in a long time nope. and he's like he's like i am blown away by you he's like you're blowing my mind and i and like blowing his mind like i was just driving the uber you're and just I, driving him and i wasn't even like prettied up i was like i like like i'm wearing some makeup now i was like tired pajamas like no makeup i'm like what is this guy and i i actually don't believe him anymore with his chakra thing i think that's a gimmick oh, yeah. that he uses to pick up women because yeah. like there actually are like people out there who specialize in like pelvic release like it actually is a thing right. women, women do it like women do it to other women they like help women find an orgasm i think it's called um uh something yoni massage i don't know if you ever heard of it. it's called yoni massage it's like yes a, okay wait wasn't there i feel like there was like a netflix documentary about it but someone was a cult leader oh that's like <laughs> i never heard of that one but um th- th- i never heard I know of, what you're talking about yeah yes, it is a thing that people do but like after he started getting into the like god brought us together and and we're i've i was looking for a woman and i haven't been this blown away i'm like all right this guy he's he's a predator like he's yes. he's trying to and like here's the thing like oh, when you're alone so in a car with yeah. somebody like that it's like uh, i i can't use blunt force against you like that would be like me trying to that would like to any men listening, that would be like if you were with a bear. Like you can't right. beat that. Like <laughs> that thing will crush you. So you have to just use your intelligence. So I had to kind of like de-escalate the situation and just like play dumb. Like so, I was yeah. like, how do I do this where I'm not rejecting him, but I'm not saying yes either. Like how could I say this? And I was just kind of like kept bringing it back to like, um, oh well, that's an interesting job. Tell me about your clients. Like I kept like taking the focus off me and like saying right. Tell me about your clients. And then like, so we got through it and at the end he was like, let me get your number. And I was like, I'll take yours. Like that was my way of like, like not not rejecting, but not giving. So I wasn't. No, and that's the scariest thing. And you kind of have to play to the ego too, to make them feel as like smart and special as they think they are for, it's just, that's terrifying. It's such a, it's such a safety, like that's a nightmare. I'm so sorry. In the Jeffrey uh, Dahmer thing that was on um, Netflix, one of the victims who got away did that he like yeah. i think he realized and it's i think it's a, it's true like I, I think there were some apparently some things in the um netflix series on jeffrey dahmer that weren't 100 percent true but a lot of it was right. true and i looked into it this particular guy um he knew he was gonna die like he looked right. around he smelled the scent of like the right the bodies and he saw like the tools and he was like this guy's gonna kill me and like oh my God, like, what is, like, that's just, like, I just kind of got the chills just saying that, but he apparently in the moment, like, figured out how to, like, give into his ego. Like, he knew that was his only chance, you know? Yeah, is just praising, like, the ego. And also, like, convincing them that you're on their side and that you're the friend again i told you i've listened to so much true crime so this is all i'm thinking <laughs> of like the, the different cases that i've heard where like that's the way out is just playing to the ego and being like no i'm your friend i'm on your side but yeah. it's like it's easier said than done it's so scary when you are in the car with the guy 
Yeah. I mean, it was daylight. So I felt a little more comfortable by the fact it was mm. daylight. I'm like, okay, I don't feel necessarily like that, but I just really like, creeped out. Like I didn't oh, like, yeah. like, listen, yeah. if you want to tell me about your weird Yoni massage job, that's fine. I'll listen to the story, but don't try to like impose it on me if I don't want yes. your services. That's when it's getting weird, you know? Right. Exactly. So. Anyways, <laughs> so, um, all right. So we've been going for about is an interesting note to end on right there. <laughs> but um, I feel like we've hit that mark. So we've been going for about an hour. So I'm going to end the podcast right here. Um, let them know. I'm going to include a link below where you guys listening can find her if you want to, if you're in the New York City area and you kind of, or not, like if you just want to hear more about her. But um, if you want to check out her acting classes or whatever, whatever you want to do, her, her stand up, her music, um, I'll put a link below. Let them know where they can find you too, in case there's anything I don't find on my own, like as far as your links and everything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Everything is kind of all umbrellaed under leorawood.com, L-E-O-R-A-H-W-O-O-D.com. And that has like all of the social media links and all of my upcoming show dates if you want to come and see a show in person. Um, but then pretty much all of the social media are at underscore Leora, just my first name. Nice. Right on. Okay. So again, listeners, Prince out of podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please don't forget to hit subscribe. Um, my mission is to grow this channel and to get it to a state that it's monetized. Now I love doing this. I would still do it for free, even if it wasn't monetized because I like podcasting. However, I would like to deliver a better product to the listeners. I would like better cameras. I would like assistance. I would like, there's a lot of things we could do. So, um, my, promise to you is that if you subscribe, I will do everything I can in my power to deliver a better product. Um, and don't forget to comment on anything we talk about. That's also very helpful for this channel, especially the people who have been listening for a while. Um, you know, you can't hit subscribe, but what you could do is um, leave a comment on something we talked about. And that's it. Prince out of podcast episode 103. Have a good night, guys. Bye. Bye.